Good morning. Um, so happy to have all of you here today. What I'd like to do is start with the video. If we can roll the video, please. There will be 1.4 million jobs by 2020 in the computing-related fields. Less than 29% of them are going to be filled by Americans, and less than 3% of that 29% are going to be women. I don't think software engineering is a meritocracy. Being excellent or being good at your job isn't enough if you're a woman in tech. The sort of phenomenon of the programmer has really interested me. Programmer. 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 It's hard to encourage more women to come into an environment that will sexually harass them and not fund them. As soon as a woman gets introduced, it's like blood in the water. When companies started putting these full diversity disclosure reports out there, it became very obvious, wow, there really is a problem. This is something that we need to be trying to address. Women were the pioneer programmers. They've been written out of history, unfortunately. Grace Hopper came up with the concept of real programming languages. Ha, uh, coding's magic. I like coding because instead of us being consumers, we could be like a producer. In the same way that everyone should know a little bit about law and everyone should know a little bit about economics, you probably should know a little bit about computer science. Growing up, I was actually a, a system kid. I didn't know that I could learn how to code like so quickly. The reason that there's a gap is actually related to some really real structural factors. Girls aren't encouraged to pursue computer science. They're overlooked because, you know, it's the boys that are good at science and it's the boys that are taking apart computers at age nine. Most students have no exposure to programming. Computer science should be a requirement in all public schools. This is a Rosie the Riveter moment because the jobs are here and we don't have the workers to fill them. For the digital revolution to truly be great, it can't just be for a certain set of people. I'm hopeful because I think that the tech industry could move the fastest. If we see the problem, we can debug it. This is our country, our cities, our communities, our children, our code. Code. Debugging the gender gap. Ooh. All right. It's really good. So the, uh, the statistics might have gone by on that film a little bit quickly. So these are the statistics that you saw in that trailer. The number of women versus the number of, women, uh, the number of men that are in these tech-related jobs. 15%, 20%, and these are in very large companies. Now, you might have noticed that I'm a woman and I'm a computer scientist. And for the last 25 years, I have often been in a room of 50 people and been one of the only women, maybe the only woman, or the only one of two women that are in the room. And I'll have a confession to make, that in all of that time, I didn't do too much about it. I would notice, and beyond that, did very little. But then, about two years ago, I had the great fortune of meeting Robin Hauser Reynolds, who's the woman here on the screen behind the camera, and her friend and colleague Stacy Hartman. They are the filmmakers behind Code Debugging the Gender Gap, which is the, the uh, trailer that you, you just saw a snippet from. When I met them and they did some filming at Pivotal, and we got involved and Pivotal sponsored the film, I started researching what was going on. I started paying attention to the stories, not just my own experience, but stories of other individuals. And I'm happy to say that in addition to being a woman and a computer scientist, I now consider myself an activist. So let's talk about that a little bit here today. What I want to do is I want to tell you a little bit of a story. I call this a tale of two ladies. Let me start out by introducing you to my niece. This is Samantha. A number of years ago, when she was around the fifth grade, she is a really remarkable young woman. She plays soccer. She's very popular. She's very social, great at math, great at science, and really fantastic young lady. Here's another young lady. Yep, this is me, about the same age. I'm about the fifth grade, and aside from being decidedly more geeky than her, we share a lot of things in common. We're both good at math, good at science, and here's the interesting thing. We're both proud of that. I remember talking to Samantha and her being one of the smartest kids in her class and her being really happy about that. So let's fast forward a little bit. 
Here's Samantha in high school. Let's eavesdrop on a conversation. Samantha says, today was a moderately good day. And her friend says, yeah, except math. And she says, oh yeah, <laughs> yeah, I'm so confused. So wait a minute, what happened here? She was really good at math and proud of it, and now all of a sudden she doesn't understand? What happened? Well, you know what? She and I aren't that different at this age either. I'm in high school, and I too am way too cool for computers. I'm going to be a horse trainer. I'm going to spend my career doing something outside, doing something really cool. But then our stories diverged because I was super lucky. When I be started my junior year in high school, I ended up in a computer science class. And I was way too cool for that class to the point where I ditched. And for those of you who maybe don't know the, what, what the word ditched means because you're from a different country or, or so on, that means I just didn't go to class. For the first two or three days, I didn't show up. And on the third day, I showed up, and written up on the board was this program. And my teacher said, who wants to try it? And I, you know, I'm sitting back there with my arms folded, no, I'm too cool for this. And I took the opportunity, I was curious enough, I typed in this code. And when I typed the letters R-U-N, and it started scrolling the numbers on the screen, I went from to, whoa, this is cool. So I had my moment, I had self-selected out, but I was exposed, and, I, and, it, and it hooked me. And from that moment on, I've been a computer scientist. So it's all about exposure. Now this, when we talk about that self-selecting out, this is the face of computer science, right? This is the popular culture face of computer science. It's all men. This is what the young girls are seeing. Well, you know what? This is also the face of computer science. This, the front and center, is Reshma. She's the founder of an organization called Girls Who Code. Girls Who Code takes the challenge of exposing young women, high school students, to computer science, giving them the moment that I had when I was a junior in high school. And they'd run this through code, uh, code clubs, as well as summer immersion programs. Let's talk a little bit about the outcomes. There's a couple of statistics on here I want to draw your attention to. 90% of the students, over 10,000 of them, go on to major in computer science or engineering in college. But even more interesting is the statistic in the middle, which is to say that almost 80% of those students wouldn't have majored in computer science unless they had been exposed. So expo exposure is a huge thing. Now, we'll fast forward a little bit again, and here's Samantha as a, as a freshman in high school. And here I am in college. Yep, that's me in the back of an El Camino. Didn't spend all my time in, from, in front of a computer terminal. But here our stories diverge again. When I was in college in, in the mid-80s, about 35% of the computer science students were women. When Samantha went to her orientation for her, um, and she is, by the way, a computer science major, when she went to orientation, she came home and I talked to her on the phone that night and she said, eh, there weren't very many girls there. 200 students, about 20 women. So the numbers have dropped dramatically. It's, the number stands around 18% now. Now things can be done about this. The University of Washington, for example, has finessed their programs. They have made it so that the initial programs in computer science, the initial classes, um, teach uh, subjects and teach it from the perspective of things like biological sciences or social um, issues, things that tend to interest women. And they also have professors reach out to the young women who take the freshman class, encouraging them to take the next class. Here's another interesting statistic. This has increased their numbers from around 13% to in the 30s. So they're back to where, at University of Washington, they're back to where the industry was in the 1980s. But 58% of the students who went on to gra um, graduate in computer science, the women, said that they were not initially interested in computer science. Again, it's exposure. Now, I need to change the characters just a little bit. 
because my niece has not graduated. She's not in the workforce yet. She's still a student. So I'm going to change the characters, and now we're in the workforce. A number of years ago, uh, actually about a year ago, a company named OneLogic put up some recruiting posters in the San Francisco area with pictures of the engineers working at that organization with some of the quotes on why they like to work there. And here's one of them, a woman named Isis. And she is a, a, a computer scientist that works at OneLogic. Well, when she posted that picture, a number of people took to social media and they accused OneLogic of hiring a model for their posters. How, why would they do that? Well, they did that because they said she didn't look like an engineer. As a result, ISIS did a number of things. She published a post on Medium, but then she also published a photo of herself to Twitter with the hashtag, I look like an engineer. Well, that started a revolution. And over the course of the next couple of months, tens of thousands of engineers, men, women, white people, people of color, a whole slew of engineers posted their photos to Twitter saying, I look like an engineer. Now, why did those people say that? Why did they say that she didn't look like an engineer? Are they evil people? And I assert that they're not. What they were just doing is reflecting their implicit biases. They had categorized people based on the information that they had received and had been coming into their, their cognition for some time. The reality is that we all have implicit biases. We all categorize. And we could have all made that same mistake that some of those individuals had done. So it's up to us to recognize those biases and compensate for those. And there's even technology. I'm a technologist, so I like to apply technology. There's technology that can help us adapt and compensate for those, um, for those implicit biases. Now, the other thing that I want to show you is this. Let's challenge our assumptions. Let's challenge the way that we think about things. I was recently at a conference where over the course of three days, there were 18 keynote addresses on the big stage. All 18 of those were made by men. There were some women who showed up on stage, and they were the performers that opened the conference. No women technologists or business people were on the big stage, only women who were there performing music. I found that quite disappointing. So finally, it's the right thing for us to do this. It's absolutely the right thing. We need the talent. We need to go across the entire talent pool. But I want to point out to you that diversity is also good for business. Companies with more diverse executive boards have higher return on equity and higher EBIT. It's measured. We know this. The other thing is that companies that are hiring, they're trying to attract and retain talent. For that talent to be able to come to your company, it's important to them that you have diversity initiatives. So in order to get a diverse pool, you need to be thinking about diversity. So in closing, what I want to say is that it's up to every single one of us. It's up to us to understand the implicit biases that we have. And I invite you to watch this video that talks about those implicit biases. It's not our fault that we have them. It's only our fault if we don't do anything about that. The other thing that I invite you to do is get involved in any number of programs that are out there. Girls Who Code, I'm proud to say that Pivotal this year is not only being a field trip location like we have been for the last couple of summers, but we have in Palo Alto, and I'm delighted that I'm going to be able to, to um, be part of their graduation ceremony on Thursday this week, a group of 20 young women who have gone through the seven-week summer intensive program at a pivotal location in Palo Alto. So get involved, get your companies involved. And also, be a good model. Model the right behaviors for your children, your nieces, your nephews, your children's kids, for your colleagues and for the industry. Please, we can all be part of the solution. It takes all of us. Thank you very much.